But we used to have this little phrase when we were around one another, I'm seeking the Lord the more. You know, it just has a holy sound to it, the more. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm learning how to praise God the more. And so that's, I, I found that phrase in Scripture, the more. And so in Acts 5, 14, and believers were the more. You know, that, that meant he, God was really putting it on. He was really packing on the pounds to the church. The Lord and believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women. So once you have the addition and then by the more, then this thing ratcheted up to by multiplication. So if we look in Acts 6 and 1, and in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, multiplied. Uh, and I looked at a couple of ways to multiply. One is exponential increase. Exponential increase. When uh, the exponent tells how many times to multiply the big number by. So if you have 8 squared, that means 8 times 8. Or if it's 8 cubed, it's 8 times 8 times 8. The number that is raised tells you how many times to multiply the big number by. So God exponentially added to the church. It was blowing up. Thank God for, and I looked at a website called the Pew Research, and Christians worldwide amount to about a third of the population. Now, those, that's just who call themselves. Now, you know, you know and I know. Everybody that says they're a Christian is not. Now, they just may be in Christian environment. They may be in Christian circles. But uh, only those who are living the life can be positively identified as Christian. But about over 2 billion people over the face of the earth fall under Christianity. And quite a few are in Africa, in Asia, really growing in those areas. Exponential increase. And then also, I like what's called compound, compound interest. Compound interest is different from, from simp simple interest. Simple interest is when uh, your principal never increases as far as the interest yield is concerned. So if you put a principal in of $100, and you're getting 5%, and that's, and that's high. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm having a, a dream when I say 5% interest. Now, they may charge you 5% interest to pay and more uh, to pay back. But earning 5%, but if you have $100 principal and it's 5%, then each time it's, it's, it's time to add that, you would only get 5%, regardless of how much interest has been already paid. You only get that $5. But I like compound interest, where after the interest has been provided, it is now added to the principal. So instead of 5% of $100, next time it's 5% of $105. And so the principal continues to grow. And I believe that's how God grows. I think he grows with compound interest. Because, you know, he's, a, he's just a big God anyhow. You know, he, when God does something, he does it abundantly. You know, the last time I checked when I got grace and mercy from him, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't last year's rate. Thank God God keeps up. The, the cost of living gets high. And every now and then we fall into some bad, sinful things. But thanks be unto God, he has compound interest. And his grace and his mercy is sufficient to take care of whatever problem you've fallen into. You can't get into too big a mess that you can't turn to God. Now, the, the devil will lie to you and tell you, are oh, you too bad to ask God for forgiveness? Are oh, you lived wrong too long for God to forgive you of all you've done? Oh, no. His grace, I hear Paul say, is sufficient. Whatever you've done, God's grace will cover that. Whatever you've said, God's grace will cover that. It doesn't matter how long you've lived in sin, God's grace will cover that. It is compounded interest of grace. 
Whatever you need, God will supply. So we have growing gains. Growing gains. Secondly, we have growing pains. Growing pains. Everybody likes things that grow. But growth comes at a price. Praise God. You like your babies to grow, but it comes with a price. That means more food, new clothes, and don't let them start talking. Now you have to start speaking pig Latin because they're going to tell whatever you've said. You know, babies, all babies are just re little recorders. They, you know, and our lick letter was right. Kids say the darndest things. And they're used and not lying either. Kids will just tell you what it is. My mama said, and you know, and she's already told everybody, don't say nothing. And my mama said, and there they go. And you're trying to look at the child, and the child won't look at you. Mama said, and you're making noise, and they, mama said, and you already know what's getting ready to happen. You're trying to stop it, and then you, when you can't take it any longer, you run and try to get the child and put your hand on the mouth. Ooh. Growing pains. So the church was growing, and, and when anything is growing significantly, especially at exponential rates, it, it's blowing up, it's exploding with growth. Things can get chaotic, and I can understand how in the midst of, uh, of uh, uh, extreme growth, things can get out of control. So I, I looked at chaos, that's a state of being out of control, and it's a possible reason for some of the issues overlooked uh, by the growing entities today. A, a, a man named Lawrence Johnston Peter put out what's called the Peter Principle. The Peter Principle. And it goes something like this. In a hierarchy, every employee tends to rise to his level of incompetence. Simply put, We'll go as high as we can handle it. And usually we'll reach a point where it's just about over our heads. And when life, you know, we don't like it just having a broom and, and just, you know, pushing a mop. We want more responsibility. So we put in for more responsibility. And we're able to do that. They put you in the mail room. And, well, I'm, I'm tired of passing the mail out. I'm tired of pushing this cart around. I want to sit at a desk. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let you sit at a desk. We'll do this, let this happen for you, let it happen for you. And we continue to press and press and press until we reach a point where we get headaches. We don't want to go to work. We look for every excuse. I wonder, do I feel well today? And if we have just a little cough, we'll call in because we said we're sick. What we, what's happened is we've reached the Peter Principle. You reach the point where it's no longer manageable. Your roles and responsibilities are just a little bit above your capacity. The Peter Principle has come into effect in many entities. So when you reach that point, it's no wonder some things go lacking. Some things just go unchecked. And so chaos happened in the early church. People were everywhere believing on the Lord, and there was a daily ministration that was passed out for the deserving and the needy widows. And some got nothing, got nothing. You could understand it if every now and then I got missed. But when you get missed every day, that's not an oversight. That's just somebody is not taking care of business. So there was chaos, but also there was respect of persons. And the Bible has nothing good to say about respect of persons. Respect of person means, it, it's just a fancy way of saying prejudice, bigoted. Th that's all it means. James really put it, put it in his place. He said that there are some folks they come into a congregation wearing nice clothes. And then there are other folks that come in and their clothes aren't as nice. 
And they'll tell the folks whose clothes are not so nice to stand up and tell the ones that are dressed better to have the seat that the one that had to get up was sitting in. Respect the person is just, uh, it's ugly. I don't care where it is. It's ugly to be mistreated just because you are who you are. And it may not always be that you are like that, but just because you fell on hard times. You know, all it takes is one sickness. And you can, what used to be, be middle class can be flat broke. And what used to be caught up bills can be way behind. All it takes is just one mishap. You can be in a car wreck and your life forever is changed. You'll never be the same. We're just one step from death. We are just one step away from paralysis. We're one step away from uh, chronic, incurable disease. We are just a heartbeat away from a whole lifestyle change. So respect the persons is just bad business. But Acts chapter 6 verse 1 says that's what was going on. There arose, in the last part of verse 1, a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Instead of bringing their food on a daily basis, they were overlooked on a daily basis. It was obvious. Even among homogenous cultures, there are divisive issues. Now, it's clearly seen, race is clearly seen in America. America is not homogenous. Now, Japan, China, homogenous. Most everybody there looks the same. But America is called the melting pot. We have Europeans, we have Africans, we have Hispanics, we have Asians, we have a whole culture, we are a blend of everything. And so it's easy for people to look at somebody else and say, you look different. And because you look different, I will treat you differently. That's not what was going on here. These people look the same. And what that tells me is, America does not have a race problem. America has a sin problem. <laughs> it's not, we don't have a race problem. Blacks and whites can get along if they're saved. Hispanics and Asians can get along if they're saved. Anybody and everybody can get along if they are saved, truly saved. And don't let anybody fool you, quote unquote, the founders of this country were Support stalwart Christians. No, you don't, you're not a stalwart Christian when you, got, when you have men stillers and you're going around stealing folk. In fact, that's a sin in the, in the New Testament. Being a men stiller is a sin. The slave trade was sin. And yet they want to stand there and cry and weep and moan about, oh, we're such good Christians. No, you are not. You just had the platform. You just had the pulpit. You just had the right to speak. And everybody else was silenced, muzzled. But it was not a race issue. Never has been and never will be. This verse proves it's not a race issue. Because they were all Jews. <laughs> it was just Greek-speaking Jews versus Hebrew-speaking Jews. Now, let's put it this way. When my next-door neighbor back in the 60s, went to visit up north for about three or four weeks. And he, you know, he came back after that period of time. And the first time I saw him since he had been back, he hollered out, hey, you guys. <laughs> I said, who do him think he is? <laughs> He, he left Ebonics 
and went up north and came back Yankee-sized. Yeah. And now everybody's you guys. Wait a minute, fella. You didn't leave here talking like that. And don't, don't bring that stuff around me. That's, that's what I told him. You can leave that slang somewhere else. Take that accent back up north. That's not you. You don't go somewhere three or four weeks and come back talking on you. Know. It won't be long. You'll be like the rest of us again. We didn't have a race issue. We were both black. That was not the race issue. The issue was how he sounded. The devil will operate on any level you let him. We could all, this, this, um, this country could all of a sudden in one day lose all race. Tomorrow morning, Lord, if the Lord will, everybody woke up light blue. It still would be prejudice in America because it's not a race issue. It's a sin issue. Next, we'll be checking people's eye color. And we'll make a difference in that. We'll listen to the dialect. We'll listen to how they sound. We'll make a difference in that. We'll start making a difference. And we already make a difference in weight, height. If people don't have a certain height on them, you know, they're strange, they're funny. We laugh at them, we talk about them. If they're too tall, we laugh at them. If they're too short, we laugh at them. It's always something. As long as we're in this life, it's going to be something. And even in the church, we have to fight those issues. We have to get ahead of it. We need to be better than the world. It's sad when church folk want to call somebody a color name or, 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 or say something that's color related and then go, you know who you are. You know what you look like. That's a sin issue. That's a sin issue. And so here this, the early church is dealing with this sin issue of respect of person. And when you have that, don't you know it retards the growth? Anytime you have divisions in the church, it retards growth. Because people don't want to be around where there's fussing and fight. You know, you can stay home and fuss and fight. But, you know, we, we took too much time and too much effort. We put on nice, clean clothes. We came here, we, we got in the tub. We put some water on our body. We went through a lot of effort. We made our faces up. We put a smile on when we, we can't stand anybody. But we coming on anyhow. And then we're going to get to church and, and box. Oh, no, oh, no, no, no. I can stay home and do better. So it retards. There's a, a retardation of growth because of the growing pains, this murmuring. There's nothing that, that kills the spirit of an atmosphere like murmuring. Oh, murmuring dries up the atmosphere. Everybody laughing and talking, and once somebody come in, and everything goes, Hoop. and now you can't hear what anybody's saying, but you know they're saying something called, it's some buzz and it's some humming. It's loud enough for you to know somebody's saying something, but low enough for you not to know what is being said. They want you to know you're not welcome. They want you to know that you're not the pick of the litter. Growing pains. But if you really want to grow, ready, set, grow, thoroughly, you got to get in your right lane. Grow in lanes. Get in the right lane if you want to grow. First of all, you need to learn where to put complaints. Complaints go up. I remember watching a movie once called Saving Private Ryan. And the lieutenant, played by Tom Hanks, was asked by his squad that he was commanding that was going to try to save Private Ryan, what he felt about the mission. And he said, I feel proud of the mission. I'm, and he said all these positive things about the mission, even though 
he didn't like the mission. But he said to the fellows that reported to him, you ought to know better than that. I don't complain to you. I complain to my CEO. I complain to the, to the fellow above me. I don't complain to the people that report to me. I, my co complaints go up. They don't go down and they don't go out. If you really want something to grow, don't complain out. Complain up. Talk to people who can make the change. And when the person above you won't make the change, go over them. And that person is Jesus Christ. Go to God. God can make changes. The heart of the king is in the Lord's hands. Like the rivers of water, he turns it with us wherever he will. God is in control. He's sovereign. He can make a fellow who said no yesterday say yes today. And not know why. Nothing's changed. Other than God said, say yes. And it's over. God, what does scripture say? When a man's ways please the Lord, he'll make even his enemies be at peace with him. Oh, you I hear Jesus say, if you, abide, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be. God said you can have it. You can have it, but you got to line up. You, you can't complain everywhere. You got to know who to complain to. Complaints go up, not out in insults. See, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And that complaint rose up because the apostles heard about it. When it, see, it wasn't going to change until it got up. Complaining to folk who have no power is of no use. It serves no good purpose. You will only hurt yourself. Because all they're going to do is repeat the negative talk you said to somebody else. And now you look bad. You know, cell phones are a blessing and a curse. Because now, I don't care where you go. Everywhere, you're on candy camera. Now, Christians ought to, you know, Christianity is on display. And it's a sad day when the cell phone pops out and they're recording the Christian clowning, cussing, boxing. Did you see, did you see on, on the news the other day? where the, the bus driver, <laughs> the bus driver, you know, the young folk wouldn't get on the bus because they're getting ready to fight and all this stuff. And, you know, she out there doing this. And you already know. And they bleeping out the, half the stuff she's saying. <laughs> now, I can just imagine somebody somewhere said, look at my church member. Yeah. Somebody somewhere probably said that. My church member had no clue on candy camera. Be careful. Nowhere is private anymore. We all live in a fishbowl. There's nowhere you can run and hide. Somebody somewhere has you under surveillance. In most stores, you're on camera. In most parking lots, you're on camera. In a lot of houses, you're on camera. And sure enough, wherever young folk are, you're on camera. Because the cell phone's out. They're not playing in games every, every time. Sometimes they, they are recording you. And you'll end up on YouTube. Yep. Yeah. And they'll look at you and go, you boob. On YouTube. Clowning. Clowning. Complaints go up. If you have a complaint, don't spread it. I was in one uh, eatery, and it says, if you like our food, tell others. If you don't, tell us. Complaints go up. Commissions come down. They don't go up like in cases of rebellion. Act 6, wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of 
honest report. See this? When finally the complaint came to the apostles, the commission came down. The word came down from the authority, the seat of authority, what should be done. Look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So commissions come down. Those who can effect change are the ones that send the edicts or the command or the enjoyments or the uh, privileges to make the change. They authorize those efforts. So the commission comes down. It, it does not, you don't send stuff up. The tail does not wag the dog. You know, people get together and say, you know, we need to do something about someone's so, so, so. And they'll whisper that thing among each other, and it'll just grow and swell. And that happened to me one day, and some people were coming to me with a bunch of mess, and I knew it was mess. And I wasn't pastoring then, and they said so and so, so and so, and, and talking about the pastor. And I said, oh, no, let's go talk to the pastor about that right now. And I walked off, headed for the, the study. I looked behind, they were gone. I said, let us go and talk to the pastor. When, when it came up that the, the, uh, the one in the seat of authority was being maligned. Yeah. See, you don't, you don't talk against authority and please God. You may not agree with authority, but you don't talk about authority and please God. If you don't like your head, pray about it. First talk to the head, and if the head won't change, then go over their head, and that's Jesus Christ. Tell the Lord about your problems. Then when God makes the change, it comes down from on high. And Peter gave the appropriate response. Look out among you, you Greek-speaking Christians are having difficulty with the Hebrew-speaking Christians. Well, choose deacons among you, among yourself. Don't, don't elect Hebrew-speaking deacons. Elect people like yourself because they understand. They have your best interests at heart. They empathize. They, they feel your pain. So put one of you in office. Choose seven of you to do this job. The commissions come down. Thirdly, the compliance spreads outward. Remember what Jesus said about Pharisees? Do as they say, but not as they do. And it's a sad day when somebody says it for themselves. See, Jesus said it about them. He said, now they sit in Moses' seat. Obey what they say. But, but watch what they do now. Because they, they, are, they are hypocrites. And he called them to their face. Snakes, vipers. Whoa, hypocrites. Compliance spreads out and not down. The Pharisees would say, now this is what you ought to do. And they tell people what to do, but they wouldn't do it themselves. When you have a leader that won't do what should be done, it's time for a change. Either the leadership change or you change. Because if somebody's, if somebody's asleep driving the car that I'm in, stop, I, I, put me out of the next corner. I mean, you that sleepy, we need another driver. And if you refuse to give up your seat, for safety's sake, just put me out, I get a cab home. Grow in lanes, grow in lanes, grow in lanes. Let me just close by saying this. Ready, set, grow. Uh, we all would like to see a growing church. But I am well aware that it is not as important to me just to see numbers. That's not my chief concern. Don't get me wrong. I have no problem with numbers. But that's not my priority. My priority is laying a sound foundation. And we're going to spend a long time in the fight for doctrine. The fight for doctrine. 
because every who shot John that's in a pulpit is declaring from a position of authority that they know what this book is saying. And so many of us are saying so many different things until people hear you and they get confused. Who do I believe? They say you can do it over there. They say you can't do it over there. They said if you're in that group uh, that I'm in that I'm not even saved. If I belong over here, this other group says that they're the only ones right. And if you don't uh, baptize in this way, uh, you're wrong. And if you, it's so much confusion. And so we're going to spend a lot of time dealing with doctrine. I'm not going to pile a bunch of doctrine all at one time. I'm not going to talk about four or five things, four or five topics in one message. I'm going to deal with one subject. Her message. And when, I, and when we get to the point of doctrines of, about sin, I'm not going to deal with four or five different sins at a time. It's going to be one sin. Because I want to get the point over. I want there to be no shadow of a doubt. When we talk about what XYZ is, we need to know what XYZ is. So a growing church needs, first of all, to have a sound foundation. Uh, and the first thing that I want to say that will incite growth in a, in a body is love. Saints, you can't come in here with bitter lemon, sour grape faces. You can't come in here sucking on dill pickle. You know, you, you, you can't give people the squint eye treatment. Uh, you can't give people the, the bite lip look. You got to have love. And I'm not talking about put on love either. I'm talking about genuine love. God has called us to be greats and not marbles. Uh, some folk, when you get them together, they like, they like marbles. They clack, clank, 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 clank. But God has called us to be like grapes. He wants us to be mashed together. So that as one gives the juice and the other one gives the juice, they all get together. And, and you don't see X, Y, Z's juices it separately is all one juice so as we get together uh, we have love and how we see that uh, love is in abundance is in the harmony Jesus said by this shall all men know that you are my disciples we ought to love each other you can't love visitors until you love your church member you can't love your neighbor till you love yourself you got to learn how to love everybody and you can't have a a prejudicial love. You can't just love me, myself, and I and just love the folk that look like me and love the folk that I like and that like me back. And you got to love everybody. You got to love your enemies. You got to love people you never saw before. You got to love folk that talk about you, backbite you. You got to love everybody. You got to love the people that when they see you coming, turn their back, walk away, try to hide from you. You got to love everybody. Love is not difficult if you let God do it through you. See, when you have love, you can go to sleep at night. When you have love, you can lay your head on your pillow. When you have love, you don't go dreaming about folk because you went to sleep mad at them. Growth is a sign of love. Harmony, get along, harmony. Growth is also a sign of liberty. That means you got to let people in that are a little bit different from you. Liberty, liberty, liberty. Look at what happened. In um, verse 5, the last phrase of verse 5, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Do you know what a proselyte is? It's a non-Jew that was converted to Judaism but then this brother turned around and got saved after he was converted. Look at the progression. He was a Gentile recognizing that there was one group that served the one and only true and living God. So he converted to that. And then once he converted to Judaism, he found out that there was another one called Jesus who was the son of the living God and he converted to that. He had a heart for God. Now I, I realize that this Nicholas also and, and I know for, for, for a fact that some of the early church fathers said this is the same Nicholas that Jesus spoke about in uh, Revelation where he says, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Irenaeus, 
says this was that Nicholas that he defected, that he fell away later on. We have other early church fathers that dispute that. I just needed to tell you that so that way in case somebody would say something about, well, you know, uh, why are you magnifying this Nicholas? Because you, you know, if you had been uh, intelligent and, and, and as learned as you're supposed to be, you would have known this was the defector from the, well, you don't know that and I don't know that. I j we just know what the testimony is. It could have been another Nicholas. And it also could have been that sometimes people will put your name to something that you didn't even start. They are called themselves. Remember what Paul said when he was writing to the church of, of, of Corinth? He said, some of you are saying, I'm of Paul. Some of you are saying, I'm of Peter. Some of you are saying, I'm of Apollos. Some of you are saying, people will do that. They'll throw your name out and you don't even know you're being talked about. So before I said this brother ended up defecting, and I'm just going to say that's the report. But it could be different. The scriptures are the only infallible sources we have. Early church fathers were not infallible. They could have been wrong. This is right. And I know one thing is right. This Nicholas was a proselyte. It showed that the early church was magnanimous, open-hearted, allowing people that were different from them to come in. And that's what a growing church will do. It will open doors for difference. We don't all have to be the same. We don't all have to look the same. We don't all have to come from the same background. You, you ought to have enough love in you to have liberty, to let people of difference come in and not feel ostracized. So growth is a sign of love. Growth is a sign of liberty. And growth is also a sign of life. Life, life, life. When you love something, you will tell other people about it. And as you tell other people about it, you know what they'll do? They'll come check it out. And it will grow. So growth is a sign of love, liberty, and life. Thanks be unto God. Now, child of God, what I want to do is encourage you to go out and let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven, and just let God do the work of church growth. You and I should just go out and just let our light shine. If there's anyone here tonight that wants to give your life to Jesus Christ, we want to extend that invitation to you now. But we just thank God for his word. Ready, set, grow. If you're already saved and would just like to be a member of Christ Fellowship, we gladly welcome you into our band of